Jo uh, come here and sit down. We're going to start joining us this evening on the piano for the Star Spangled Banner is Mr. Greeley. All rise, please. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. <clears throat> Are there any town meeting members who have not yet been sworn in? Any new members not yet sworn in? If so, please rise. Seeing none, Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Stephen Byrne, Chairman, Board of Selectmen. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 18th, 2014 at 8 p.m. May 19th? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Oh, good. Let's finish tonight. In that regard, uh, the last two me meetings, we, we thank you. The last two meetings, we've not commenced our in actual business until 8:45. Um, the minutes meetings before that, it was 8:30 one night and 8:35 the other. That's uh, better than two and a half hours of time we've spent on resolutions, committee reports. Please, I'm speaking. Report committee reports. And um, what else did we do? Committee reports, resolutions, and just general announcements. Um, while these are all important information, most of it could be imparted on writing and handed to us. We could read it, and then they could be summarized for the committee reports and announcements. While I commend the committees for their hard work, we all know how to read. We don't need long resolutions. So in order to gauge the feeling of the meetings for limiting time. Tonight on our test vote, we're going to take a yes-no vote to see if we want to limit the time to a shorter amount than the seven minutes than it's currently we've been going with. So if you're in favor of a shorter time period for announcements, resolutions, and committee reports, please press one when Mr. Flynn gives us the okay. Okay. All right, so one, if you want to limit the time to a shorter amount, two, if you want to keep it at seven, and three, if you want to abstain. Yes, sir. These are not binding. These are just to gauge the feeling of, no, non-binding, just to gauge the feeling of the meeting. All right, go ahead and vote. One, if you want to limit the time shorter, two, if you want to keep it at seven minutes. Well, you've got to vote now during the 20-second window, otherwise it doesn't count. All righty. So 126 want to limit the time, 21 want to keep it, and two abstained. Now that being said, it looks like people want to limit it. Mr. Flynn, one more test vote. 
This time we're not going to run through the names, though. Press 1 if you think 5 minutes is fair, 2 if you think 4 minutes is fair, and 3 if you think 3 minutes is fair. No, these aren't questions. These are just non-binding that I want to find out what the meeting wants. I'm not taking questions. No. Nope. Well, they, that's, shh. I get to decide. The moderator gets to set the rules of the meeting. Or we can have a bylaw change. So one if you want five, two for four, three for three. Mr. Flynn? Oh, wait, a clock. Don't vote. You'll get a blank. Ah, uh, shoot. Vote. Yeah, it should be working. You're not ready, Steve? Oh, sorry. Darn it. You didn't give me a green card, so I should get a red card for that, right? One, five minutes, two, four minutes, three, three minutes. Okay, now we can vote. Okay, one, five minutes, two, four minutes, three, three minutes. Okay, time's up. Uh, 58, one, five minutes, 31. One four and fifty one one three. All right, so that's a basically seeing what the meeting wants to do. No changes would happen this year till next year, anyways. Does anybody have any announcements or resolutions? <laughs> Madam. Ah, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm collecting quite a bunch of glasses. If anybody's lost glasses, come on up and see if they're the, yours. Go ahead, Angela. Okay. Angela Olszewski, Precinct 17, and Chair of ATED. I just wanted to let everybody know, because we voted last year, that the booth is up. Um, we're working on furnishing the insides right now, the visitor information booth. And um, we're also looking for volunteers to staff it. So if anyone is interested, please come see me or Ted Peluso at break. Thank you. Mr. Berkowitz. Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. Just a reminder that residents who are concerned about the proposed tar sands oil project, that was our article number 20, will be in the lobby during the break for you to express your support should you care to do so or engage with them in dialogue. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Mr. Tremblay. Oh, by the way, we had a blackout the other night and it was dark. Uh, the town building facilities has put in new emergency lighting. You'll see four of them down here, and there's four upstairs. These are permanent. The building is going to get an electrical upgrade, but in case we lose power, we can be able to see our way out now. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Tremblay. Uh, uh, Ed Tremblay, Precinct 19. Mr. Moderator, I have a, uh, a report from the tree committee to deliver, but it's nothing written down. It's impromptu. We'll just vote. To, so is that a re do that now, or do we do that? Under you want to do it now? Well, well go ahead and do it quickly. I have nothing to, okay. I'll if we don't have to give a report if you don't want to, that's the whole point here. I'll, I'll be less than three minutes. Um, the, the tree committee, uh, I, I did get asked for a tree committee report. So the tree committee would like to report that, that, that we have planted a couple of memorial trees. One of them is up on Robin's farm to, uh, to remember Brian Murray. And, uh, That's what he said. Yeah, and uh, so um, now I forget what else I was going to say. It's all set up. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Livergood, do you have an announcement? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ryan Livergood, Director of Libraries. Quickly, I just want to point out that this is your get out of jail for free card if you have overdue library materials. We're trying to get some materials back. So if you have some overdue materials, please return them until May 31st. And I also have some highlights um, from uh, 2013 for the library. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none. Are there any reports or committees that has to, or official reports that have to come off the table? If not, um, that's going to bring us right to Article 30, capital budgets. Mr. Tosti, no, excuse me, Mr. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 8, and uh, Chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. Uh, next slide, please. First, I'd like to um, just introduce to you the members of the committee, Steve Andrew, Citizen Appoint. You hear me? First, let me um, introduce the members of the committee, Steve Andrew, who is Assistant an Appointee, Andrew Flanagan, our Deputy Town Manager, Paul Olson, the Treasurer's Designee, Diane Johnson, School Department Designee, um, Ruth Lewis, our Comptroller, Tony Lionetta, uh, Brian Rarig, I think, who is here tonight, um, and uh, Ruth, Ruth is also here tonight. Uh, and Barbara Thornton, a citizen appointee. All of these people work uh, very hard in this plan. They start in um, the, so towards the end of August and work through about February meeting two to f three times, sometimes four times a month. And uh, I'd like to express my thanks to them. And also to Mike Booten, who, um, he, you know, Andrew Flanagan and Mike Booten are sort of the brains behind the operation. So thank, thank them for their efforts. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, this uh, slide behind me shows uh, some of the reasons and motivations for capital planning. And I just want to draw your attention to the second to last bullet, uh, s which suggests that successful capital planning uh, facilitates postponing some capital expenditures in favor of others. It's a part of the planning process. Uh, I sometimes refer to this as delayed gratification. And, um, you know, some psychologists like Abraham Maslow and others have described this as. Uh, the development of personal maturity, in this case, uh, organizational maturity. And I think the town of Arlington has done exceedingly well in um, amongst the various departments being able to uh, go through the give and take that allows uh, one uh, project to get priority over another, and then eventually the turn comes around where their projects get funded. This is a system that works quite well. Next slide, please. Um, just a word about our practice. We have um, a five-year plan. It's, oh, I should mention this purple book is your capital planning uh, guide for the night. And the budget is in there, although the official budget is in the orange book because it's, the capital, it's a, a budgetary article on the Finance Committee. But the budgets in both books are the same. The, the articles in both books are the same. Um, but we, uh, for years, have planned to uh, uh, our capital budget to stay within 5% of the non-exempt town budget. That means uh, exempt debt, uh, water and sewer, things that are not directly taxed that year uh, within the limits of Proposition 2 and a half uh, are the budget that we live within. We've had 28 years of successful capital budgeting, that is getting uh, projects voted and approved by town meeting within that 5% limit. And we strongly uh, recommend that we stick with that 5% limit as we move forward. Next slide, please. Um, this slide lists uh, projects that have been completed from past capital uh, budgets, uh, as well as uh, projects that are in progress, mostly from last year. Uh, these are also mentioned in the report. Um, you know, success has a lot of fathers, so I wanted to call um, your attention to the completed reconstruction of the Thompson School. And uh, I'll have a couple of words to say about that in, in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, summary of the capital budget and plan. There are three categories uh, in, the, in the budgeting and planning. We call them bond, cash, and other. This year, we're asking for uh, your approval of a total of $17,803,005. And that's spread out amongst um, $12,568,705 that we're asking you to authorize the town to borrow, uh, a million, uh, roughly million five hundred fifty-four thousand three hundred that the town will spend in cash out of um, this year's uh, uh, tax appropriation, and then other means uh, projects that are funded by grants, by uh, CDBG, by, by uh, enterprise funds, etc., that don't directly hit the tax rolls. And you can see in the uh, funding sources 2015 diagram there 
that 70% uh, is bonded, 21% is uh, other, and about 9% is cash. Next slide, please. So I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of uh, big projects that are in a capital plan. Uh, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on them unless you ask questions about it later, which I'm not, uh, you know, you can, but if we want to get home tonight. Um, the first, uh, John Cole of the Permanent Town Building Committee described the community safety building uh, project. We originally planned this in five phases. Um, the first two phases have been extremely painful to the, um, to the uh, police department because of just the general disruption and the long time that the con contractors have been there. So we're bundling the, the, the last three phases into one phase. We're asking for uh, $373,000 to uh, complete the planning of the final phase and uh, 600,000 uh, to finish it. Uh, the central fire station, 6,500,000, you also heard about that from John Cole. Um, I'd like to mention that uh, on the Parks and Recreation slide, um, we're spending this year uh, 602,000 on Parks and Recreation, and in the past five years, uh, actually past dozen years, we spent about uh, just under six million on Parks and Recreation facilities and have a total of three million in the five-year plan. Uh, finally, um, not finally, but I'd like to draw your attention to a $452,000 expenditure for school computers. Uh, this has to, uh, this funds uh, uh, new resources for teachers as well as for students. The teacher resources are, are being driven by the need for teachers to be able to uh, meet the new assessment guidelines that, that uh, are being enforced by the state and federal government. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the Thompson School in uh, Thank Town meeting. The fact that the Thompson School project was funded and completed on time, uh, completed without increasing taxes of, of the uh, citizens was, was largely because of the town meeting's uh, ability to uh, vote the appropriate resources to, to fund that, uh, that effort. Uh, I'd like to also, on the next slide, mention to you that um, uh, while we have the high school ahead of us as a big project, the Stratton School uh, Initiative uh, shouldn't be forgotten. It's part of the rebuild campaign from 2000, and we're going to be coming back to you uh, next year with some more re uh, requests for that. Um, if I can ask you to go two slides ahead to the uh, slide with a chart on it that says funding uh, Arlington High School. Um, the Arlington High School project is going to be fairly substantial, uh, probably in excess of $100 million. <laughs> And it's going to have to be funded through an, uh, some sort of a debt exclusion, which is the way we have funded the past uh, the $80 million that have been spent on the elementary schools. In the slide behind me, those two arrows point to inflection points That's where the pr previous uh, debt has been retired. And um, we will be coming back to you, I hope, uh, as a town, to ask the town to consider to um, do additional debt exclusion funding to help um, meet this significant project. Uh, project. And I ask um, that you, uh, respectfully ask that you support uh, Article 30, the capital budget, as recommended by the Finance Committee and the Capital Planning Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, on page 5 of the Capital Planning Budget, uh, excuse me, page 6, top of the page, there's uh, $30,000 set aside for Arlington High School, School exterior doors. I wonder if somebody could briefly explain that to me, please. Mr. Fossey will address that question. Uh, the school department has requested um, uh, you know, spending to increase the uh, security of the building. They, I think there are thir 13 or 15 doors in the building and um, more than that? Oh, sorry, 52 doors. Um, but, you, you know, in, in today's environment, uh, having security uh, in the school is a, is a critical issue. Mr. Moderator, uh, in an article in the town newspaper, 
dated March 13th of this year. There is a interview with an architect, Laurie Coles, on the condition of the high school. And in one of the paragraphs in the article, it states, the school's 50 or so doors leading outside are not attached to an alarm system so they can be propped open without school administrators knowing. My problem is this, Mr. Moderator, with all the tragedies that have happened across the country between Columbine, Virginia Tech, and et cetera, with all the expertise and all the skilled people that we have in this town, no reflection on any of them, but why is it necessary that we have an outsider come in to tell us that Arlington High School is not safe for our kids? Is that a rhetorical question, or do you want an answer? That's basically a question, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Hainer? Oh, Adam wants to address it. Mr. Chapelain is going to address it. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, the report that you're citing uh, by the architect, Lori Coles, is part of the much larger report that was put together uh, as sort of a, a needs report on the overall building needs of Arlington High School. Uh, so we wanted that outside expertise to come in, take a look at the programmatic needs of the high school, and tell us what could be or would be part of a potential rebuild. Uh, and one part she did look at was the security of the building and the exterior doors. So this isn't a situation of hiring someone to tell us that our building's not safe, but rather hiring somebody to come assess the school, look at what the programmatic needs would be in any kind of renovation project, and this was one element that was addressed. I have to tell you, Mr. Moderator, that when I read this, and even now, I'm quite uncomfortable to the fact that it doesn't sound like a condition that just happened overnight. I just really can't understand how such a condition has gone on and somebody really not acquainted that much with the town finds out about it, that this condition has existed for a while. I guess in closing, Mr. Moderator, I'm just looking for one thing. I don't know if I'm not going to get it or not. We just finished completing, I think, the seventh school in the town of Arlington. Can anybody in this hall right now, without question, guarantee that all schools in the town of Arlington are safe? And could they go on record with such a statement? Mr. Hainers raised his hand. Bill Hainer, Chairman of the Arlington School Committee. I cannot guarantee 100% anyone is safe anywhere. What I can tell you, I as the Chairman of the School Committee cannot get into any school building without being checked in and signed in every single day at every single one of them. I hope that gives you some, some every time you try to secure something and somebody tells you it's 100%, you'll find somebody that will break that security. We're doing the best we can with what we've got. I'd like to quickly reflect back to the last question. The committee and the administration have well aware of the security in the high school. We have constantly been looking for things. This study provided specific uh, information to go forward for the expense for it. Lastly, Mr. Moderator, I don't know how it's done, but a suggestion only that maybe all the security tours are all doors in all schools should be randomly checked just to be on the safe side. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stephen Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I have three things on the capital budget. The first one is going to be a, um, an observation. The second one is going to be a motion. And the third one is going to be a, um, a question. So I'll do it right very quickly. If you look at your budget book, the orange book from FinCon, page 14, you'll notice the, um, and the manager had alluded to this um, during the warrant articles earlier in the um, meeting, and you'll see um, on item number 17, $230,000 roadway improvements, cemetery division of the public works. So let me tell you, um, the rule of thumb is it's about a million bucks to rebuild a road. You all saw the pictures. The roads in there are trashed. There's huge um, uh, ruts on every road throughout it. There's two to three miles of road inside the cemetery. 
This $230,000 is a Band-Aid at best. And because we all know that the, it's used for a lot of other purposes other than visiting the cemetery, this, while I will not uh, urge you to vote against this or to remove this, uh, it's merely a Band-Aid. Um, there's millions of dollars worth of road work in there to be done. The second thing is a motion. I also want to draw your attention to page 13. And you can see on item three, there's a $225,000 columbarium. I don't know if I pronounced that right. It sounds painful. Um, construction for the cemetery. Now, that's coming, it's under the other category. So there's no appropriation, but there is. It's coming out of the revolving fund that you'll vote on uh, Article 52 or 53. It's coming out of the graves and burial plots revolving fund. And that revolving fund, you can use the money for that. And you know, earlier in this meeting, I heard over and over again up here and with uh, conversations with people that you know, I've raised the attention of town meeting, I've raised the attention of the condition of the cemetery. Something's going to be done right away, certainly before the next town meeting. Not if there's no money. And if you look through this report, there's no money to fix the damage that's been done. There's a Band-Aid to skim coat the road, but there's no other money. This money shouldn't be in here to build a columbarium. Now, you'll hear that it pays for itself. You'll hear, if the cemetery commission was here to speak to this, that it would pay for itself. There was no discussion of this at the FinCom meeting. I watched it on television. There was no discussion. I couldn't make it myself and argue against it there. But you'll hear that this is a money maker. Well, if it is, bond it. Put it in a bond. Let it pay itself off. That's the right way to do a capital expense. Don't take it out of a revolving fund when you really need to have that money for maintenance. So I'd like to make a motion to strike that $225,000 columbarium construction from the capital budget. And I urge you to support this. The last thing is just an observation, and I talked to Mr. Foskett about this. And it's um, on the same page, 13, there's um, item number one, and it's design and renovate new, new food pantry space. I love the food pantry. I mean, uh, my family has donated consistently. Um, I think it's a great idea. And it, my understanding is it's located in the basement of a church. And I don't understand what town meeting's doing appropriating or raising money or, or what we're, I don't know what we're doing. I don't understand this. So, Mr. Moderator, that's a question. Is this actually monies that we're going to raise or somehow get and use to renovate a private property? Mr. Chapterling? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So uh, you can see uh, under section two um, on page 13 of the finance committee report, it speaks to various capital projects and equipment purchases that shall be undertaken and financed by grants or other funds. So this is not a direct appropriation out of any tax dollars. So this $150,000 uh, expense uh, would be solely raised by private donations to the food pantry. And uh, currently the food pantry is looking for a new, uh, a new site that would be more accessible and friendly to those who use the food pantry. So uh, this is not necessarily money that will be spent on a private site, but either way, it is uh, solely from the donations to the food pantry and not raised by any tax, uh, tax dollars. So we heard that this section is money, it's federal money. It's, um, we know it's out of revolving funds. Um, it's not clear to me where it's coming from. And so, um, you know, I'm not gonna be the bad guy against the food pantry at all, but I think that it's something that certainly should have a lot more explanation than being hidden inside of the, um, the capital budget. And that's a point I forgot to make on the column bar barium. You know, we have a five-year plan for the capital budget. You saw it, right? This expense was not on the five-year plan last year. It came out of nowhere. Twice in the past 10 years, 
This project has been in front of town meeting on a separate standalone warrant article, and both times it's failed. To bury it inside of the capital budget and to put it in a place where you think you're not appropriating money when it's coming out of a revolving fund, I don't like it. Thank you. Hold on. Was this motion distributed to the members earlier this week? No, I, a, yes or no, sir? Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Uh, no, it's an amendment. So uh, it, striking it, one item. You could, you could reject Stephen, it, sir. Stephen, please, that's all I needed is a yes or no. I'll allow this because it's very simple. But these are things that should be. Does anyone want to second his motion? Second. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. But these are kind of things that should be distributed. Um, Mr. Fuller. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. I have questions on three items in part three of the recommended vote. Um, first, line four, $500,000 replace phone system. Uh, seems like a lot of money. Can someone explain how comprehensive this replacement will be? Uh, Mr. Greeley? Oh, no, no. Oh, I thought you wanted to talk about the phone. Um, either Mr. Foskett or Mr. Good, one or the other. Mr. I think um, Mr. Good can explain in a little bit more yeah. detail the Mr. Good, please. Thank need you. to replace the 15-year-old phone system. Uh, David Good, uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, the half a million dollars for the phone system will replace the existing switch that resides uh, in the basement of the high school that services all town and all school buildings except for the Otteson School. Uh, the Otteson School has a separate system uh, that is uh, approximately 17 years old. Uh, the system that supports the rest of the town uh, located in the basement of the high school is creeping up on 15 years old. You'll see a second line item in the capital budget for rebuilding the town network. Uh, the project will include us going to voice over IP, which requires the infrastructure to be rebuilt, which is the switching and routing gear, uh, along with then uh, the phone infrastructure on top of that and all the phones uh, in the town and school. Thank you. Uh, next, line 14 in part three, 126,000 radio frequency ID system for the library. Uh, can someone explain what that is and what we get? Mr. Livergood, can you? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ryan Livergood, Director of Libraries. So the idea behind the RFID system, it's radio frequency identification. It's these little chips that we put on our physical items. And um, what that does is it's an inventory system and helps us improve the efficiency of um, circulation activities, check in, check out. Um, just throwing out some numbers, and I don't want to get too involved, but um, you know, our circu total circulation is up 26% since 2002. Um, you know, we're in the top 10 in the state in total circulation. And you know, our staffing levels are down since then. So we, we struggle to keep up with the volume of all the materials that we deal with every day. Um, so, so that's the, the real quick answer. I can get into more details if you'd like. Hopefully that answers the question. So that'll improve efficiency. I think it's money well spent. Um, next question, line 33, $250,000 for Hardy School windows. Um, I think we renovated that whole building in 2001, so why is it necessary to replace windows now? Mr. Foster is going to address uh, th that. There have been uh, problems with the uh, lentils around those windows almost uh, in the building near, near the windows almost since the beginning of, uh, since the time it was renovated. Uh, there's been a lot of work done to mitigate the problem since then, but it hasn't been satisfactory. Um, if we don't replace these windows, uh, then the, uh, the envelope of the building is going to be threatened. So uh, we've had some uh, outside people come in and look at it. And they have a solution, and the town should go ahead and do it. OK, sounds like it'll save a bigger headache later. Um, and one further comment on 
Line number 39, 53,000 to replace four digital payment parking meters. Hooray, it's about time. Thank you. <laughs> Costa. Barbara Costa, Precinct 10. Just another question. I don't. I don't uh, line 30 of the same uh, item. Spy pond tennis courts purely for my edification. 467,500. And why is it so high? Again, Mr. Fossett will address it. Sorry, I, I didn't hear your question, Barbara. It was about the Spy Pond tennis courts. Yes, line, uh, line 30. 30. The, why is it set so high, 467,500? Uh, uh, it's competitive bidding, and uh, that tennis court has been in um, pretty, pretty difficult disrepair for the last uh, 15 years. It's been uh, requested by the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission. It's been part of their uh, five, seven year plan for renovation. Um, I haven't put a tennis court in my personal property lately, so I can't tell you that, uh, that you can find one less expensive, but it's been uh, you know, well evaluated. And I happen to have a tennis player in the family. I know. Who uh, would, would shoot me if that doesn't get passed. I, I thought of that when I asked the question. Thank you. Mr. McCabe. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 30 and all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to debate Article 30 and all matters before it. Mr. Flynn, whenever you're ready. We're going to vote one to terminate debate, two to not terminate debate. Okay, go ahead and vote. Whoops, nope, not that. That's doing. There we go. So go ahead and vote one to terminate debate and two not to. Okay, 131 to terminate, 46 to not to. That is a two-thirds vote. Debate on Article 46, Article 30, and all matters before it is terminated. So first, we're going to vote on Mr. Harrington's substitute motion, which he wishes to strike out item three under section two, the $225,000 for columbarium construction. He wants to eliminate that columbarium. All in favor of his motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Thank you very much. It is declined. We have five people rising. We have to do an electronic vote. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Flynn. Yes, madam. No, it's five people, just like the old rules. If five people doubted the vote, they can call for an electronic or a counted vote. Not on, not on this, ma'am. We just did a voice vote, and it was three. Two, it, it, it lost overwhelmingly, but we're going to go ahead and do the exercise. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Flynn. Uh, could, I, could I ask a question first? Yes, sir. This is on the amendment. If, yeah, yeah. if you wish to his amendment, vote yes. If you want to vote against his amendment, vote two. You ready? So one, if you wish to eliminate the columbariums, two, if you do not want to eliminate them. One yes, two no. Okay, time's up. We have 40 in the affirmative and 127 in the negative. The amendment loses. Now we're going to go on to the main vote as recommended by the Capital Planning Committee and the Finance Committee. Yes? 
Yeah, we're going to use our clickers to get a two-third vote because this involves bonding. So whenever you're ready, Mr. Flynn. Yeah. So because this is bonding, we need a two-third vote. So one is in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee. Yeah. Very common with Precinct 12, Mr. Monterey. Uh, the, the book had six different votes, so are we just doing them all for? All at once. All at once in yeah. for two-thirds. Okay. We'll need them up. That's how we've done it in the past, so yeah. we'll continue with that. Yeah. Okay. So one, yes, two, no, and go ahead and vote. And time's up. 172 in the affirmative, seven in the negative, zero abstention, so it does pass by two thirds. Thank you very much. That closes Article 30 and brings us to um, Article 32. Did we vote on 32? 33. We did 32. I didn't write it down. Oh, I see. Article 33, we have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee, $750,000 for appropriation. Oh, recommended vote of the Finance Committee in Article 33, $750,000 for appropriation of water, and s water mains. Anyone wish to address this? Seeing none, whenever you're ready, Mr. Flynn. Okay, so yes in favor, and two to oppose, so go ahead and vote. Okay, time's up. We have 178 in the affirmative, three in the zero in the negative. It is a unanimous electronic vote. That's a funny. 178, zero, unanimous. And that closes Article 33. Brings us to Article 35. 35. Recommended vote of $37,533. For all these different commissions, it's a majority vote. Anyone wish to discuss this, Mr. Fuller? Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Um, I think this is the first time Transportation Advisory Committee has been in this vote, $15,000. What are they planning to do with the money? Mr. Tosti. Mr. Smith wanted to tell us, but Mr. Tosti jumped in The Transportation in first. Advisory Committee uh, takes on certain jobs as, as uh, distributed by the Board of Selectmen in regards to any uh, issues involving transportation, uh, streets, intersections, et cetera. Uh, they last had an appropriation of $25,000 back in 2001. And over a period of time, they have gradually used that up. Sometimes they have to hire consultants. Uh, to do particular work uh, on study in a particular area, whether it's traffic counts or uh, things like that. Uh, they finally run out of that 25,000. Uh, well, they still have 5,000 left, and they came in uh, looking for another, uh, I think it was $35,000 they asked for. The Finance Committee decided that we should do a shorter time period. Um, so $15,000 plus the balance they have should take them through the next couple of years. Thank you. They do good work. I wish we could pay them for their time. Thank you. <laughs> Did anyone else wish to um, address this article? Seeing none, this is just a majority vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Let's 
That closes Article 35, brings us to Article 36. Recommend a vote of the Finance Committee for Town Celebrations, $10,167. Anyone wish to discuss this article? Seeing none. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. The unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 36, brings us to Article 37. Recommend a vote of the Finance Committee, $8,014 $8, for legal defense and indemnification costs. Anyone wish to discuss legal defense and indemnification? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 37, brings us to Article 38. I recommend a vote of the Finance Committee of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. It's a no action vote, and I so declare it. Brings us to close Article 38, brings us to Article 39. Appropriation water bodies, $40,000. Um, sir. Yes. Who had that substitute? Uh oh. All right, wait a second. Did I have enough? Did you rise? Did you vote on the prevailing side? Yes, you did. You wish to reconsider Article 38? Yes. yes. All in favor of reconsideration of Article 38, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Article. It is two-thirds vote. Article 38 is now open for reconsideration. Sir, come forward and give me your substitute motion. Yep. Go ahead. You you have I, somewhere I do. I'll find it. I have a copy. Yeah, I'll take a copy. But go ahead and address it first. Hold on. Go ahead. You're on. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Bill Downing, Precinct 15. My motion is to request $205,000 to reduce fees for elementary instrumental music and high school athletics. Thank you. This appropriation would cut these fees in half. Extracurricular activities keep our children in school with the incentive to, to do well. I see this as an affordable way to lengthen the school day. And how is it not just that? Our children, our children are learning new skills in an organized atmosphere, being instructed by adults, most of whom are professional teachers. At most of the best prep schools in the area, extracurricular activities are required, not options. The importance of these activities has been well chronicled. The cognitive benefits of elementary school music and the lessons learned in team building, pride, and hard work that athletics provides are invaluable. Many children are trying to find themselves in high school, and many do so through sports. However, when a family has to pay two to $500 just to try a sport, it puts undue pressure on that child. I'm sure that many don't even try. This is the atmosphere that we have created, and I believe that needs to change. $205,000 sounds like a lot of money, but in the larger picture, it is less than a half percent of the school budget and less than 0.2% of the town budget. The school department was given an additional $885,000 this year beyond their 35 for general education and 7% for special ed. Of this windfall, they chose not to put one dime towards reducing these fees, which are some of the highest in the state. I appeared before the budget subcommittee on two occasions and asked for funding point blank, and was told very nicely, no, point blank. I understand the school department has many concerns, including the high school and classroom sizes at the Audison. However, we have years to resolve these problems. Some relief should be given now to the families that have been straining to pay fees that keep their children off the streets, out of trouble, in a healthy learning environment. The cost of this program is significantly cheaper than the cost of truancy and intervention programs. A child's family has to pay $435 to play an instrument. 
I feel this fee is prohibitively high for one child, never mind if the family has two or more children who would like to learn an instrument. If the price were halved, it would still be difficult for most families to afford. As for high school athletics, Arlington's fees are some of the highest in the state. On the board is a spreadsheet of high school athletic fees. With line one displaying Arlington's fees, the second line, the league average for the sport, and the third line, the percentage difference between them. If you read across to football, Arlington is 183% higher. Golf, 81%. Soccer, 45%. Basketball, 74%. Gymnastics, 249%. Hockey, 222%. Baseball and softball, 74% higher than league average. <coughs> Cheerleading looks like a bargain, but when you add in the choreography fee, we're about 35% higher than league average. And that is not the end of it. Parents are still expected to fundraise, work the concession stands, and all the other details associated with games and meets. I think the very least we can do is lower our fees to be more in line with league averages. I for one believe there is a price point that should be met so that extracurricular activities can be enjoyed by all. And I believe the fees currently charged by, for Arlington families is far too high today. If the school department decides not to use the appropriation or the money to sustain these fee cuts as town meeting wishes, then perhaps next year they should receive no additional funding beyond their 35 and 7% increases. I am asking for the money for one year only. To sustain lower fees, we should use the $200,000 that has been put aside each year in the school budget to settle a lawsuit that has now been settled. In closing, the parents and children of Arlington are asking for your support. Please don't let them down. Vote yes for this appropriation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tosti. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could go to uh, the back of the Finance Committee report of uh, the spreadsheet on D1. Now this is the spreadsheet we do all the time, five, six year plan, just showing you what's happening. And the first thing I want to point out is if you go down, you have revenue on the top, then you go down to appropriations, and then you go to school, and you see um, an increase under general education of, of almost a million one, an increase under special education costs of a million seven. And then for some reason, the growth factor didn't carry over there, but that's 885,000. So we have increased the school budget by 3,054,000 this year. That is very generous. Uh, it, it's, it's perhaps more than we can afford in future years. If the school committee, uh, which is entirely within their discretion, decides uh, to uh, reduce the athletic fees, um, it should come out of that $3 million. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we feel that's the case. If um, we simply can't afford more money, so if you take 200,000, and then, you know, if you do it each year, that'll raise that deficit. If you look over at that $12.8 million deficit in 2020, that'll add another million two to that deficit. And what we're going to be trying to do over the next several years is get that deficit down. This will expand it by a million two. Um, secondly, um, the town meeting can't force the school committee to do this. Whether to the setting of fees uh, is entirely within the school department's discretion. Um, finally, no, no one likes to have to pay more for services. Uh, the taxpayers are certainly paying more for services. The ratepayers and water and sewer are certainly paying more for services. 
uh, virtually all the recreation services, rink services, everybody is paying more for the services in order to maintain the services and the financial health of our community. I don't think it's unfair that parents contribute to the support of some of the extracurricular activities that their, their children take advantage of. Um, and finally, I'd like to mention that the school department has methods in place to ensure that no one is denied a service or the uh, ability to play a sport or music because of inability to pay. That is in place now. I urge you to vote no action on the substitute motion. Thank you. Mr. Harrington, Stephen. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I'm going to give you a little history. Uh, Bill's actually cringing because, you know, I'm, I'm like terminating debate. I'm the guy who everyone's going to vote against, right? And I support this, and I'll tell you why I support it. Um, I've had a lot of history with the user fees. I worked with the school department four years ago to cut the fees in half. And they cut them in half for all of the fees except for three biggest sports, football, hockey, and gymnastics. And those sports, far and away, it's 85% boys that are paying, the, not the highest fees in the state, the highest fees in the nation. Arlington made the Wall Street Journal. So the fees for those sports are way too high. And the reason that they cut them was because they were charging $400 for a sport like cross country where the kids ran around inside the building and uh, they brought their own shorts. And you know, you can't do that. There's actually this case law that says you can only charge up to the cost of it. And so, you know, they're charging up to the cost of it right now. And I want you to think of it this way. There's a family cap on sports fees of $1,250. And we heard earlier in this town meeting about how the CPA was $86 a year. This sports fees is a $1,250 tax on families that, a uh, couple hundred families that are supporting this. It's not, and, and, and this isn't just sports, also instrumental music. This is a tax that far exceeds, and it's not for a single year either. Generally, these families that are paying this, that have, you know, they hit the, they're in there for three years, I mean for 10 years. They're paying $1,250 extra for 10 years. Now I can go into the cognitive benefits of instrumental music. I paid up a lot of money for my children to make sure they had piano lessons. It's really good to encourage young children to have instrumental music. The same thing with athletics. I'm not an athletics guy, okay? But I have learned of the value to so many students that athletics does for them. And so, some things we socialize. Education is something that we socialize. And it's important that we socialize the cost amongst the largest group of people that we can. And that's why in Massachusetts we have the concept of a free and appropriate public education. And we subsidize that across as many people as possible. And make no doubt about it. Athletics in high school is part of the legislator's foundation budget. It is not a choice to have it. It is something that is part of a free and appropriate public education. And we should subsidize those costs across all taxpayers in Arlington and not just a small subset of them. And then finally, I'd like to just mention that uh, you know, the previous speaker said that this is going to be going on for five years and it'll add $1.2 million to our deficit in 2020. Um, but Mr. Downing clearly said that this was for a single year. So I'm not sure where he got that. And as well, um, there's, there's a fundamental misunderstanding here. Um, having gone through this process myself several times, you go to the school department, they have a budget, subcommittee in December, they bounce you to the finance department who says, well, this is a school department, we can't do anything for you, and there's this sort of like gray area. And I finally figured out what the real problem is. See, this money is not for the school department. This money is for those two or three hundred families, or the six hundred families that do instrumental music and high school athletics, 
And the only way we can get it back to them is by putting it through the school department budget. The school department doesn't want this. They don't care. It's not going to be for them. It's actually for the residents of Arlington. And I urge you to send a message to the people of Arlington because you're looking for a 1.5% surcharge on property taxes, and I don't think you want to have 400, 500 families in town paying 10 times or 15 times that amount on a, what's a tax on a free and appropriate public education. Thank you. Gentleman in the red shirt, right next, yep, you, next to the exit sign. Yeah, you. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Nathan Spilling, Precinct 4, I move to terminate debate on all matters. We have a motion to terminate debate. Okay, Mr. Flynn, when you're ready. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. One to terminate debate, two, no, negative, do not. And go ahead and vote. Okay, voting is closed. 125 to terminate, 56 to not terminate, it, debate is terminated. Excuse me? Yeah, I can do it. When you're ready. We have first um, Mr. Downing's substitute motion. Whoops. Here we go. All in favor of Mr. Downing's substitute motion, press one. And all opposed, press two. And go ahead and vote. Okay, the voting is closed. We have 77 in the affirmative, 105 in the negative. The substitute motion fails. We go back to the recommended vote of the Finance Committee of all of no action on Article 38. All in favor of no action on Article 38, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No. No, no action vote. We now go on to Article 39. You have to get 30 people to see the screen. Okay, 30 people is not arisen. We are now on Article 39. $40,000 recommended vote for water bodies. Anyone wish to discuss water bodies? Water bodies. Article 39. Water bodies. $40,000. Anyone wish to discuss it? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 39, brings us to Article 40. We have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee for $7,500 for the Harry Barber Community Service Program. Anyone wish to discuss the program? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 40, brings us to Article 41. We have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee of No Action. Mr. McKinney, what purpose do you raise your hand? Well, get up and do it. Mr. McKinney has a substitute motion. Okay. Let me start fresh here. Nice. Andy O'Brien. I got you. Go ahead, Lawrence, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, um, the thing's supposed to go backwards, right? Does it go backwards? Time's ticking. I got you, yeah. You're first. 
and somebody else raised again. Mr. Okay. Dice have his hand. Well, anyway, I'm here. I'm here for perhaps an, an opportunity to be good old Johnny One Note again, and uh, I have promised everybody I'll get through this in less than seven minutes. Um, and since I'm not quite sure, I'll also try to get through this as fast as possible by even skipping a few. The reason I'm here today is because back in, uh, back in 212, we passed an, an article which suggested that we were going to have four special signs for four special historic areas. And this is very important because we don't have very many historic areas. Uh, we have a freestanding statue, but no site. Uh, we attended a lot of meetings to be able to assess the fact that Uncle Sam was in fact an important part of our, our uh, you know, our... Uh-oh, we have a problem here. <laughs> What's happening is, is that um, we're looking at a previous one, it's going back and forth. Is there any way I can just go forward to it? Okay, so we had the first, the first um, uh, proposal for the signs. And the problem was the first proposal for the signs, the Uncle Sam sign disappeared. And did he miss it? Well, he would have had to be. Um, I'm going to have to ask the, uh, to put this on the table or propose. This is the wrong slideshow. Is there anything I can do to do that? Can I ask the moderator? I, it's what, you got the wrong slideshow? Yeah. How many slideshows do you have? It's the only one I have, but it was, it was all edited, and then I, well, I'm not getting the one. What, not, now we've got a new one. Dude, you, you've already. That's the one that's supposed to be there. Well, hurry up. You have four minutes and 41 seconds okay. left. Okay. Well, here's the person. You see, the voters said that we're supposed to get four historic sites, and the Uncle Sam Memorial statue was one of them. Okay? And the thing is, is that it's not simply they took it away, but they took it away completely. There's Old Schwab Mill, Jason Russell House, Silas Down, and Visitor's Information. Now, the fact is, Uncle Sam is our tourism hook. We were going to, in February, to put up a signboard that would effectively say something, but um, we didn't put it through because at the same time, we, this was put before a proposal for some signs. Now, the sign for uh, Uncle Sam just did not appear. It, it disappeared. None of the participating groups had been notified. And we were wondering whether this was a mistake. Did Mr. Barisi simply miss the Uncle Sam Memorial statue? But he says he was looking at the Minuteman on a bike. And if he was looking at the Minuteman on the bike, he was looking right at the statue. So it appears that H had originally intended no sign for Uncle Sam. Uh, by the time it got to the warrant, they had been enough complaints that the Uncle Sam Memorial statue was stuck in there. But town meeting was concerned. Who's making the decisions? You have to include the sites. And so it added language to make sure the sites would be included in any process. They would have to let us participate. Things got, and then in consultation with the four organizations related to the sites. But things got wobbly from the start. The statue disappears. The new plaza replaces it. But why mention the statue? The visitor asks, why in Arlington? Is it something special to see? We know Uncle Sam, so what's the connection? Let's check it out. I'm looking for the Uncle Sam Memorial statue. Is that a statue? Battle Rose says there's a statue. But it's worse. Last summer, with no notice to anyone, even Uncle Sam Plaza got dropped out at the bottom. We found out no mistake. Now you know why our Uncle Sam Memorial statue doesn't have its sign. The sign's been hidden in storage, so town meeting wouldn't know that Uncle Sam Memorial statue had been eliminated. We don't know if Uncle Sam has been left out of any of the other placements or the gateway. A. Ted has done no sharing. The whole $5,000 worth of historic Arlington theme branding for a summer's visitor facility. Do we have any signs? <laughs> uh, excuses you might hear. It's already done. We don't have the money to make another one. We got wind of this last September. We were told it hadn't been finished and it could be changed. A. Ted could have kept that agreement before paying Boston sign to go ahead. But we've checked with, and with the account and there is plenty left from last year's to do it. Or you just got a big beautiful sign. Can't have two. We went over that. We can't read anything in the bottom. 
we need something to say something, and this is for a historic site, not a tourist building. What's next, a historic parking area? <laughs> Jason Russell needs to as well. The A. Ted sign doesn't say enough. For a while, Jason Russell had three signs. The double sign is really more about not asking. First, nobody ever did a study before they asked for the sign proposal. Beds were not advertised and few were solicited, resulting in high prices, mixed messages. Two signs next to each other is too many. No. The Uncle Sam Plaza sign is only there temporarily until construction is finished. It moves to the rear. But we need a sign for the visitor's building. Have one made. Visitor town meeting gave a Ted 40,000 for those signs and one was for us. Please put up the Uncle Sam Memorial statue sign. Okay, let's have a drum roll. Um, could I ask the town um, moderator to ask the town manager a question? Ask me the question. Um, is this a Uncle Sam Memorial statue sign or is this a visitor's information sign? Mr. Chapdelaine, do you have an answer to that specific question? You know what this sign is? Does this sign exist somewhere in the town's premises? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I believe that's a sign that points out to visitor information, uh, visitor information center located at the Uncle Sam Plaza. Thank you. Do you have any, do you have any indication that AIT had ever communicated with us at any time about these changes? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, my understanding is that both ATED communicated with you, and I know that me and you both, uh, me and you sat down for about an hour and discussed this change as well. Before, I mean, did they communicate with us and say they were going to change it before they changed oh, he, he, it? He answered your question. It's not, this isn't, time's up. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the fact was we didn't find out until it's changed, and it was specifically that we were supposed to be consulted and there was supposed to be a chat room. We were supposed to have our sign. Okay, do we have that, a, sec a that, second for Mr. McKinney's motion? Time's up, Lawrence. Second. second. Okay. okay, seconded. Thank you very much for your indulgence. I did it with, within seven minutes. Uh, Mr. Tosti's next on the list. No, I was speaking to the mic. Whoops, sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, so they say in my comment, this is a dispute over the wording of a sign. The town manager, after consultation with all parties, decided that the sign would say, the visitor center, Uncle Sam Plaza. Now, a few feet away is a whole sign that we set up. I think it was unveiled at the uh, last town day with a whole sign about Uncle Sam and wording and everything else. So there's an Uncle Sam sign right there, and then there's gonna be another sign at the visitor center maybe 10 or 15 feet away. The manager decided that it didn't make any sense to have two signs that said the same thing 15 feet apart. We, the article last year, put this under the jurisdiction of the town manager to decide the wording of the signs. I think this is a decision for the town manager to make in consultation with the others, which has already been, you know, which he said he did. Um, this is not really an issue for town meeting to decide on the wording of a sign. I urge you to vote no action on the article. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's your point of order, sir? Dean Carmen, Precinct 20. Is the motion in scope because it's directing the town manager to spend money? I mean, it says ATED, but the original article said that the money is to be spent under direction of the town manager. So we are effectively saying, no, we're going to tell the town manager how to spend the money. No? Uh, so is it in scope? Let me, let me take a look at it. Restore or replace it. or replace instructed that it to produce and install. I, I, it's, it sort of is. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of, he's, he's asking us to produce and install or restore and replace a sign that seems to already be there. Um, maybe we want to just talk about it real quickly. Mr. Deist?
John Dice, Precinct 13. I move the, uh, to move the question on this article and all issues related thereto. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on the article and all related, all substitutes related thereto. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Flynn. Yep. Thank you. This is a motion to terminate debate. One for yes to terminate, two for no. Go ahead and vote. Okay, time's up. 157 people wish to terminate debate, 20 do not. It's a more than a two-third vote. It passes. The vote debate is terminated on Article 41. We have before us Mr. McKinney's substitute motion, which we'll vote on first. All in favor of Mr. McKinney's substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my vote, in my opinion, is a majority vote of no on Mr. McKinney's substitute. The motion fails. Fails. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a majority vote. No action. That ends Article 41 and brings us to Article 42. We have a recommended vote of no action on Article 42. Mr. McKinney, do you have a substitute again? Do you have a substitute motion? No substitute, and no one speaks on it. We only speak on things we have something to talk about. Right now, the only thing to talk about is we recommend a vote of no action on Article 42. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it's a majority vote of no action. That brings us to Article 43. Oh, holiday lights. Yep. So we have a recommended vote of the Finance Committee of no action. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a unanimous vote of no action. And that closes Article 43. Brings us to Article 44. Recommended vote of, again, no action by the Finance Committee. Number 44. All in favor of recommended vote of Finance Committee in Article 44, no action, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Unanimous vote of no action, I so declare. That brings us to Article 14. That's a recommended vote of no action. It's a unanimous vote. We now brings us to Article 45. Um, recommended vote of no action. Anyone wish to discuss Article 45 or have a substitute motion? See, huh? I don't know. I'm not in control of that. Dave, can you show 45? There you go, Sean. Recommended vote of no action on Article 45. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No. It's a vote of no action. I so declare. Article that closes 45 brings us to Article 46. We have a recommended vote of $5,000 for the Battle Road Scenic Byway. Anyone wish to discuss the Battle Road Scenic Byway in $5,000? Seeing none. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is in. in is an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 46, brings us to Article 47. Uh, Finance Committee is recommending zero dollars. Anyone wish to discuss zero dollars? All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a majority vote and unanimous majority vote to spend no money. And I so declare it. That closes Article 40. Seven brings us to Article 48. Sir. Why, why were we not able to discuss uh, Article 44? Article 44? Because we had no substitute motions on 44. Because there's not no action votes. It, we have a recommended vote of no action. We don't discuss it. Like the one we just did, they had a recommended vote of zero, so we could discuss it. <laughs> now we have Article 48. Appropriation, OPEB, trust benefits. 
Uh, we're spending a lot of money here. Anyone wish to discuss OPEB trust benefits? How much money is this? 400. <sighs> 650, about $950,000, $960,000. You want to discuss it? No? All right. All in, favor, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 48 and brings us to Article 49. Uh, acceptance of legislation, increased minimum allowance. Uh, we have recommended a vote of the Finance Committee, increase the recommended from 250 to 500 a month. Anyone wish to discuss that? Seeing none, all in favor? Yes. yes. Opposed? It's unanimous vote, and I still declare it. Brings us to, we'll close with 49, brings us to Article 50, Appropriation Long-Term Stabilization Fund. Finance Committee wants to put $100,000 into the stabilization fund. This requires a two-thirds vote. Anyone wish to discuss putting money into the fund? All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Ms. Lucarelli, do you certify there are at least 85 town meeting members present in voting? Thank you. Article 50 is now closed. Brings us to Article 51, Appropriation Overlay Reserves. Uh, they want to put $350,000 into the overlay reserve surplus account. Anyone wish to discuss that? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a majority vote, and I so declare it. Article 51 is closed. Article 51 is closed, brings to Article 52. Transfer cemetery funds. The town transfers 150000 for the cemetery commissioners. Anyone wish to discuss it? First, they get first crack. You guys all set? If not, Mr. Harrington. Yes, sir. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I told you last week there were cemeteries until the end. <laughs> so um, this will be the last time I stand up. So. <coughs> If you look at this as $150,000 transfer to the cemetery commissioners, that's coming out of a thing called a perpetual care fund. And then there's a 225 into the, from the Lawson Graves Fund into the capital budget. We already discussed that. I won't bother to talk about that one. I'm going to urge you to vote no for this whole thing, and I'll tell you why. So first I want to start a little bit and tell you, um, I've talked with the manager. I've talked with the FinCom chief. And uh, we all agree that from 2009 through 2012, the Perpetual Care Fund had $400,000 of interest and dividends. We also agree that from 2009 through 2012, this body, or bodies similar to this, town meetings, appropriated and took $600,000 out of the Perpetual Care Fund. So the Perpetual Care Fund is a trust fund in some sense other than it doesn't have a death date. But it does have trustees. And if, um, who in here is a, um, a finance, uh, an investment manager? Uh, who's here subject to uh, the prudent man rule? You know, so what, what I mean by that, who here is regulated by the securities division of the Massachusetts <coughs> Secretary of State's office? Well, who here is regulated by the SEC? No one. I am, okay? And I'll tell you, there's a thing called the prudent man rule. Earlier, we heard from the manager say how he talked to the Department of Revenue, he talked to Powers and Sullivan, and they agreed that he could do something and take an a, a accounting practice, um, but he never talked to the one agency that actually regulates these funds, which is the Secretary of State's Office Securities Division. And the people who are entrusted with this, the Cemetery Commission, are actually under this prudent manual, which means that they're supposed to act in the best interest only of the beneficiaries of that perpetual care trust fund. Not in the best interest of the town, not in the best interest of the manager, only in the best interest of those beneficiaries. And that's why I wanted to change them earlier. But the real problem here is that the manager believes that Capital gains are income. 
And that's where he says we agree to disagree. And from someone who's been involved in this industry 30 years, I built trust funds, accounting systems, when I was in my young 20s that handles a trillion dollars of assets. I know the trust fund accounting. This principle is, uh, capital gains are principle, not income. And it's very clear for anyone who's in this industry to know that. And the reason is, it's very important for you to understand why. But before I get into that, I want to just tell you that in August of 2005, the Secretary of State's office did an enforcement action against St. Paul Cemetery, against the Archdiocese of Boston, because they were not handling their perpetual care funds properly. And it's very similar to this. And you saw the pictures of St. Paul's. It's beautiful compared to our cemetery. Also, in 1998, New York State Securities Division wrote in a bulletin to the Cemetery Division of New York State, as you know, capital gains resulting from a sale of stock held in a cemetery's trust fund must be added to the principle of the trust fund. They go on to talk about mutual funds, that capital gains from mutual funds must be added to the principle. We took $200,000 of principal and used it as income to support salaries. Even if we use it to support expenses, they're not supposed to. Now, this is a technical thing. You say, well, what do we care, right? Um, you care because uh, the, the finance committee chair is going to come up here and say, well, over a 10-year period, we didn't, you know, it, it averages out to zero. But for the four, five years prior to this one, that money, $200,000, did not gain as it should have. And so it's really now we owe the perpetual care fund $275,000. So when you die and you buy a cemetery plot, you pay $3,000 for that piece of land, and you pay $500 for it to be cared for in perpetuity. In perpetuity. And that goes into a perpetual care fund. Now, if I went to you and said, would you mow my lawn for $500? Well, you'd say, well, how big is it? And I'd say, oh, it's only four feet wide and six feet long. Would you mow my lawn for $500? Would you do it forever? Of course not, right? Because $500 100 years from now is going to be the equivalent of about $5. And 100 years after that, it's going to be the equivalent of nothing. And so unless you allow that money to grow, and the only way that money grows is that the capital gains are not used. You have set yourself up for a situation where you have no money in the perpetual care fund. So uh, this is in front of the Secretary of State's office now. I urge you to vote no on this article. You're the last backstop to do what is right and not take money out of the perpetual care fund that we owe over $250,000 to already. Thank you very much. Mr. Tosti, and then Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Harrington and I had a conversation about this issue, and so I decided to do some more research. Now, you've got two issues here. One is a legal issue, and the other is a financial issue. Now, the legal issue is that the, I believe the controller and the manager uh, both approached our auditors, uh, Powers and Sullivan, who have been doing our audits for many years and are well, uh, well known throughout the state. Uh, and they told us that it's not a problem to spend capital gains. Uh, they also went to the Department of Revenue Division of Local Services, which is the chief regulatory body uh, for municipalities in the state. They have a legal division with five or six or seven attorneys there. And they told us this was not an issue. Um, so from a legal point of view, uh, the manager and the controller have approached the two entities are you know, responsible for giving us this type of advice. Now from a financial issue, and uh, you know, we'll hear what the Secretary of State is. Uh, I, can't, I don't believe they'll say anything different than the other two. Uh, but that's who we're supposed to go to, and that's who we did go to. Now, from a financial issue, I said, okay, 
he was concerned is that you, if you spend all your money, uh, eventually you have nothing left to support the cemeteries. So I went to the uh, treasurer, Mr. Gilligan, and I asked for the last 10 years, actually 11 years, of end of year reports, account statements, uh, from the Perpetual Care Fund. And I went through all of those, and I added up all of the dividends and interest, not capital gains, all of the dividends and interest that were accumulated over those 10 years. And then I went through and I, I uh, added up all of the amounts of money that were withdrawn from the uh, Perpetual Care Fund. And over those 10 years, and actually it'll even go into the 11th year, the di dividends and interests alone were greater than the total amount that we've withdrawn from the Perpetual Care Fund for cemetery. So it, it's not a problem that we're with, their money is going down. Actually, the problem, you know, not a problem, but the, the benefit is it's going up. So in 2004, the market amount of the Perpetual Care Fund was approximately $4 million. As of March 30th, uh, the last of four, uh, 2014, the Perpetual Care Fund uh, was $5,553,171. And we've already withdrawn the money, but we haven't gotten all of the interest and in, in dividends and capital gains from that. So my guess is that's probably going to be another 100000 higher than that. So in the face of the worst recession that the country has had since 1932, uh, our Perpetual Care Fund has grown by over a million and a half dollars. Uh, so I think uh, from a, both a legal point of view and for, from a financial point of view, uh, the manager's recommendations and the votes of the Finance Committee and the town meeting uh, have been good votes and made sense both from a legal point of view and a financial point of view. Uh, therefore, I urge you to recommend favorable, a uh, to vote favorable action on Article 52. Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Andy O'Brien, Precinct 16. Uh, Mr. Moderator, what is the opinion of town council on the legality of the transfer of money to the cemetery? Mr. Hein? <laughs> Doug Hein, town council. It's my opinion that it's also valid. I similarly conducted some conversations with the Department of Revenue's legal staff who vetted the issue with me as well, and it's my opinion that it's also a legal uh, transfer of the money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hainer. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2, my other hat. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to know, did we lose interest on that $200,000? Which 200000 my understanding from the original speaker, there was $400,000 that was uh, used that was actually interest. Uh, it, it, there was an additional $200,000 taken out of the principal. Of the, so I guess I'm asking, how much interest did we lose? God. A, a one word answer, not a speech. Go ahead. Stephen Harrington. Precinct 13, $60,000. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11, motion to terminate debate. We have a motion to terminate debate. Since you were the last speaker on the list, I guess we can go through it anyways. All in favor of terminating the debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It is a two-third vote, and I so declare it. We now have before us a recommended vote of the Finance Committee to transfer money to the Cemetery Commissioners on Article 52. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. It is a majority vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 52, brings us to Article 50. I need my record. All right, Stephen uh, Flynn, are you ready for an electronic vote? Yes, he's ready. So one voting in favor of the transfer, two opposing. And go ahead and vote now.
Okay, time's up. We have 129 in the affirmative, 46 in the negative, and the motion passes. So that closes Article 52, brings us to Article 53, use of free cash. Anyone want to discuss free cash? You want to take a break? All right. All right, let's take a vote on a break. All in favor of a break, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. No break. Article 53, use of free cash, $3,042,925 to be ex to some of the, the, taken from the available funds in the Treasury. Anyone wish to discuss free cash? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It was a unanimous vote and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 54. We have a recommended vote of the Electronic Voting Subcommittee to discuss the clickers. We're going to discuss this and Article 55 at the same time, and then we'll take a vote on both because the articles are really interrelated. Um, first, we're going to have Mr. Helmuth give us an introduction, and then we'll go to Mr. Tosti. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12, and Chair of the Electronic Voting Study Committee. I have a substitute motion that uh, will be up on the screen uh, in a moment and was distributed the first night of town meeting. Unlike most substitute motions, this does not disagree with the recommended vote of, of a board. It's a bit of a special case. The Board of Selectmen um, agreed that the study committee's motion would be before the meeting, and I believe they have taken a vote um, and may express an opinion about that in a subsequent comment. Uh, the purpose of this resolution is simply to provide this body an opportunity to discuss your reaction to the trial of electronic voting this year and your wishes, the pros, the cons, about using the, uh, such a system in the future as we go forward. We also have a vote on a, Article 55 on an appropriation that would fund that decision if the answer is yes. Last year, just as a quick refresher, town meeting approved at the annual town meeting in 2013 approved bylaw changes that would permit electronic voting. It also approved a budget that funded this year's trial. The study committee recommended doing so because we thought that electronic voting would increase accountability to voters by allowing our votes to be individually published to the town website um, and to allow for more efficient voting. This year, um, it has been our perception that the trial has gone smoothly and I want to thank the committee volunteers and the students for their significant help in doing so. And I want to thank this body for your patience as we have learned how to use the system, for your feedback to myself, to the moderator, to members of the committee, to your questions. Um, it's been, it's been um, a good experience just to hear from, from you. And that's what we want to do with the debate, on, uh, to continue that debate tonight. I will let each of you speak to the pros and the cons of using electronic voting. I do, however, want to provide you some important information that you need to weigh in your minds, and that is the price tag. If we purchase a system, we would go through, uh, the town would go through a system with the assistance of the committee as, they, as the town manager so requests, would go through a, a formal investigation in quotes and, and bids and proposals. But based on the research that the committee has done over the last two years, it would cost about $35,000 if we purchased a system including costs to set it up and to staff it with IT staff and you know, maybe a little bit for potential equipment upgrades, uh, but that would be at the very most. We'd hope to spend a little less than that. Um, and that would be for the first year. So that would be buying it, setting it up, and running it in the first year in town meeting. There is, in, in successive years, a smaller cost for software licensing and staffing in successive years that would be less than $5,000 a year in operating, ongoing operating costs. A purchase system would last at least five years, is the projection we have in consultation with this vendor. And if we purchase the system, other town bodies, such as, for example, the planning department, could use the equipment in other public meetings to solicit audience um, feedback and response or for other purposes. Um, and in fact, I've had a conversation with the, uh, with the director of planning uh, inquiring about that possibility. It is also possible that the town could 
decide to continue renting a system, which comes with an operator from the vendor and a backup for the operator. Uh, the cost of that really depends on a number of factors. One of the biggest ones is how many nights of town meeting we have uh, and how much we want to use the system. So we'd have to investigate that. Uh, based on the information that we have now, it appears that generally speaking, if you annualize a purchase or if you look at the annual cost of an average rental, we're looking at, a, at an average annual cost of about $10,000 a year to be able to use this system. Um, and to me, that's the most sort of useful figure is to think about what the cost is from year to year. If we move forward with this tonight, if we say that we want to use the system and we want to fund it with the appropriation that's been voted by the Finance Committee, which I think you will hear about, um, then we would study this carefully over the coming year and I believe in coordination with the Capital Planning Committee, the Town Manager, and whatever other bodies uh, were deemed appropriate. Whether that price tag is worth it, whether electronic voting is worth money, is, is up to you. And that's what we're here to discuss. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tosti. In your uh, motion, in the Finance Committee motion under Article 55, uh, on page 26, it has a blank. Uh, so I'd like to amend that motion to, to add $35,000. Now, the Finance Committee voted 11-1 to recommend this to you, but it's really your decision. It, it affects, you know, how you think this one, this year uh, and, and will go into the future. We're going to spend between eight and $12,000 a year, uh, whether we, um, probably a little cheaper if we buy it, uh, more expensive if we decide to lease it each year. Um, we've left that decision up to the town manager. Uh, in consultation with the Capital Planning Committee because he's got to go out and, and bid this um, on that. So um, I, I think it's, it's up to you to decide whether the eight to $12,000 is worth all the, uh, I think certainly, um, I think it speeded it up a little bit. That's just my own personal opinion. And of course, everybody's going to know how your vote, which is the transparency that people were thinking. Now, if the finance committee, if, sorry, if the town meeting does vote to go ahead with the 35,000, um, I will subtract that from Article 56. Uh, so that's where, where the cost will be, will be made up. Uh, and look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second on Mr. Tosti's amendment? Okay. We can make that administratively because we have all the language there. We just need the number. So he wants one third 35,000 into the blank. Next on the list was Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Kevin Greeley, Precinct 11. I rise, Satchel, to support this. I don't think there's any question that uh, this has been a significant improvement. And I think uh, without even having one roll call vote, those of us who have been here before and have gone through the reading of 252 names, uh, that alone is part of the reason I think that we're going to be ending this evening, God willing. I'd like to add, a, a, I, I, I've already been asked why, what, why I did not vote on CPA, because I wasn't here that particular evening. Uh, so people certainly are noticing it and using it in terms of the transparency issue. I would like to add a wish, which I raised with Eric and the committee the first time they brought this before the Board of Selectmen. We now have the technology Every one of us, as you know, mine's number 125, every one of us has an identified clicker to, our, to the town meeting member. I, to, I think with the technology that exists, it now would be easy for us when Mr. Uh, moderator uh, calls for a Warren article upon which we know there'll be a lot of debate to list the speakers on the screen as we click in to put those speakers on the screen and there are some, if I saw they were about to speak, I would move to close debate. <laughs> <laughs> there are others I would not speak myself because they certainly would do a better job. But the technology exists. It's crazy to have just the moderator spend all his time trying to read whose hands are up here in the audience 
He can't, how can he listen to the debate on these bigger issues when of 252 of us, 30, 40 hands are going up at one time? So I would add that wish, but whatever we do, please support this. I think it's been an excellent improvement. Thank you, sir. Just a comment on that. We asked OTI if we could do that, and they said no. Um, they said it wasn't recommended. Something with the software. We can explore that if we go ahead and buy the system. We'll ask them if they can investigate that. Get rid of them. No. <laughs> Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I um, like to move both questions and all matters before us. Thank you. Motion to terminate the debate on all matters before us. Well, let's use the clicker. <laughs> all right. Uh, motion to terminate the debate. Press one for yes, two for no. Go ahead and vote. And time's up. 125 want to terminate debate, 53 do not. Debate is terminated. We have now before us a recommended vote of the Electronic Voting Stub Committee. I'm intentionally not going to use the clickers because that way you can vote your mind without having the town know about it. All, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Electronic Subcommittee, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a majority vote. Do we now have before us the recommended vote of the Finance Committee for $35,000? All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a majority vote in my opinion. That closes Article 55. Thank you for giving us clickers next year and into the future. Article 56, we have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee for $4,300,000 for stabilization funds. Mr. Tosky. We just have to subtract the $35,000. So please add in the number 4275363. 4275363. Okay, we can make that change administratively. We have a second. Okay, we have a recommended vote of the Finance Committee to appropriate $4,275,000. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Is Oh, it's a majority vote, and I so declare it. Um, Ms. Lucarelli, did you certify that there are 85 town meeting members present voting in the affirmative? I certify that it is a, actually a two-thirds vote. And that closes Article 56. That brings us back to Article 2. Mr. Tosti. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. All in favor of taking Article 3 from the table, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Article 3 is on the table. I move that the 19, or 19. 19. <laughs> I, I move that the 2014 annual town meeting be dissolved. All in favor of dissolving the annual 2014 town meeting, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Thank you very much. We did it in five and a half nights. Please be sure to return your clickers tonight. It is very, very important yes. that you return your clickers tonight. Thank you.